Good morning. It's good to greet all of you on this beautiful Lord's Day morning when we will honor our veterans. And it's good to have those of you who are viewing us online with us this morning. Welcome. A couple of important announcements that need your attention this morning. A reminder that today is the last day to order poinsettias for Christmas. If you need an order form, they are available on the Narthex table. Tomorrow is the last day for you to provide Thanksgiving gift cards uh, instead of the typical Harvest Home display that we have. We're using gift cards for that purpose this year, and we will still be collecting them through tomorrow. This past summer has been a bountiful one for the grass, and our Two of our trustees have been responsible for mowing, and they did an excellent job. We'd like to give you a chance to say thank you to them. We'll be receiving a love offering in the boxes in the narthex for the mowers, uh, meaning the men who mowed, not the machines. <laughs> a reminder that Christmas church decorating, Christmas is coming. Decorating for the church will happen on Saturday, November 27th at 8.30. We would appreciate your help. We do want to recognize the altar flowers in honor of the birthdays of Greg Scherzer, November 15th, and Cora Wolf, six-year-old Cora. Can you believe Cora is six already? November 19th. And for the wedding anniversary of Amy and Alex Wolf, November 24th, presented by Ken and Pat, and we greatly appreciate the flowers this morning. Janice and Donna have an announcement that they would like to share. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Donna and I are here to give you an update on the holiday shop that we had yesterday. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank everybody who donated baked goods. We had a, a huge table of baked goods, and they all looked very delicious. I could have bought one of each, but I couldn't do that. Um, but thank you very much as far as um, putting them in containers and wrapping them. That saved us a lot of time, so we really appreciated you doing that. Thank you. We also want to thank everyone who came on Friday night to help set up, who worked in the uh, holiday shop during Saturday. For those of you that came on uh, after the holiday shop to tear down, um, we want to thank everyone that bought food for the food stand. If it was not for you guys, the holiday shop couldn't have gone on. Uh, if you don't mind, if you baked, worked, bought anything for the holiday shop, please stand. We want to recognize you and let everybody else know who were the ones that came and helped. So bought something, baked something, worked in the holiday shop. Let's give them a, a round of applause. Thank you again for helping us and again, if it wasn't for you guys, this wouldn't be going on. I'd like to share with you the money that we collected yesterday. At the shop, we got $1,309.91. At the food stand, we got $356.25. And this morning, we did have some baked goods back there left over, and some people bought them, and there's still some back there. But as of this morning, with just donations and uh, people buying baked goods today, we got $106 so far today. So our total is $1,772.16. Thank you, Janice and Donna, and thank all of you for your support and encouragement. Next Sunday is Thanksgiving Sunday, the Sunday before Thanksgiving, and so many things we have to be thankful for. We would like your help 
we'd like to put together a photographic collage for the screen of things that you're thankful for. Um, you can either take a picture, an old picture that you may have, and send it to the church's email address. And then next Sunday in the time before the service begins, we will show those pictures on the screen. Anything for which you are thankful, person, thing, event, we'd like to give you a sample of the kind of thing we're looking for and show you something for which Janice and I are particularly thankful. <laughs> Olivia and Clara are five months old now. And we are incredibly thankful that they are healthy and developing well and being strong. And my, our daughter and her husband are increasingly thankful that they're able to get some sleep. So whatever you are thankful for, send a picture of that to the church's email address. And we will provide that collage before the service on big screen next Sunday. A couple of folks visiting with us this morning. Pat Hartman's daughter, Betty, is with us this morning all the way from Wisconsin, and we're glad to have her here. And Vince Benz's family is here. We're glad to welcome them. Uh, Phyllis, did you know they were coming? You did know. Okay. Welcome. It's good to have all of you with us this morning. I... And Lori, where are you hiding, Lori? There she is, all the way in the back with Dad. It is good to have all of you with us this morning. Harvey. Shirley Putt and Bob are back with us, and we're glad to have them with us this morning as well. Yes, Vince. You mean you let a woman push you around? <laughs> We're glad to have her with us this morning. Thanks very much for being here. If there's nothing else, let's take the time to be quiet before the Lord and settle our hearts and listen to the prelude as we prepare for worship this morning. Let's stand together as we sing.
read responsively Psalm 47, 147. Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant and fitting to praise Him. He determines the number of the stars and calls them each by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. Sing to the Lord with grateful praise. Make music to our God on the harp. His pleasure is not in the strength of the horse, nor his delight in the legs of the warrior. The Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. You may be seated. Hey kids, what's the most valuable thing in the world to you? Maybe it's your favorite toy. Or maybe a stuffed animal. Or your blankie. Well, in today's lesson, Jesus tells us what he thinks should be the most valuable thing. He did it through a story called a parable. Or is it a parable? It's a parable. And Jesus would tell them to teach important lessons. Jesus told a story to describe the kingdom of heaven. The first part of this parable is our memory verse. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. So a man finds a hidden treasure in a field, and then he hides it again. And then he went out and sold everything he owned so that he could get enough money to buy the field. And that's it. That's the end of the parable. So what was Jesus trying to teach us? Jesus himself is the treasure in the field. Jesus wasn't talking about a treasure like money. He was talking about something way more important than that. He was talking about himself. Without Jesus, we could never make it to heaven. Following him is the only way to get there. But that's not all. There's another lesson to learn from this parable. For lots of people, Jesus seems hidden. Like the treasure was hidden, Jesus seems hidden to some people too. It can be hard for some people to find Jesus, especially if they never go to church or have friends that will tell about him. But Jesus isn't hiding from any of them. He wants them to find him and have a relationship with him. A relationship with Jesus is the most valuable thing in the whole entire world. That's the whole point of this short little parable. Jesus was teaching them that Having a relationship with him was the most valuable thing. The man in the story sold everything he had just to get the treasure. So we should be willing to do whatever it takes to follow Jesus. We shouldn't let things like friends or school get in the way from him. We should be willing to give up everything to follow him. So next time you're thinking of the most valuable thing you have, don't think of your favorite toy or stuffed animal. Think of your relationship with Jesus, the most important thing ever. A relationship with Jesus, the most valuable thing in the world. But there are other relationships we have that have value to us. And this morning we're going to recognize those who have contributed so much for us to live in this land. I'm going to ask if those of you who are veterans, you have served in the armed forces of this country, would you stand please? Now, I'm going to ask that those of you who are the spouses of veterans, would you stand, please? 
if you're able. Now, if you are the parents of a veteran, would you stand? If you are the child of a veteran, would you stand? Isn't it amazing how far-reaching the influence of a veteran can be? Please be seated. I've asked Chaplain Bill McElroy if he would come to pray for you and all those who have served and are currently veterans. Bill. I think what I'm going to do is, um, if I call your branch, Come up here with me, and we'll pray together. Uh, Army, if he can make it. Let's just stand in a huddle. Navy. And I suggest that if the steps are a challenge, gather here in the front of the platform. Right down here, too. Marines? Got any Marines? Coast Guard. Air Force. Now we throw in the National Guard, too, <laughs> and Civil Air Patrol. Good. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's have some prayer, OK? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, for your grace, you lead us and guide us in yet another time of remembrance of so many who have died in wars, even chaplains, and those who came home or did not. Some came home maimed. Some came home in a casket. And Lord, we are familiar with all those things. And Father, we are grateful for those who are standing here remembering and we give you the praise that we continue to be a strong nation because of all who have served and given their all. Lord, may your blessings be upon us today and every day. And Lord, we wish, wish that you will continue to guide us in our various places where we go, where we live, where we find ourselves on, on any given day. And may we shine as Christians, may we shine as Christians in those around us on the outsides to let them know that not only are we ones who have served, but we continue to serve for Jesus. And we give him the praise. Jesus is all worthy. And we praise him and we love Jesus. And we will continue to serve him and no other. For this I pray, 
Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Yes. People for whom we have just prayed have served our nation. And this morning, we're going to give you an opportunity to serve the kingdom. It's one way to serve, but it's important. As the ushers come to receive your investments in the work of God's kingdom in this offering this morning, let's pray together. Jesus, you showed us exactly what service looks like. And so often it is costly. It's the very thing to which you have called us as followers of yours. And so help us follow that example in the way we give this morning. And we pray that you will use these gifts to your glory and the furthering of your kingdom, in Jesus' name, amen. of concerns for prayer to share with you this morning. Irene and her husband Clarence had uh, made contact and asked us to continue praying for her daughter Donna. Donna is in the hospital yesterday. Uh, She is dealing with COVID and For the first time, she ate a half a sandwich. She is constantly asleep. Please continue in prayer for her and for Gardner and Georgiana. Gardner is at the Leffler Center. Bill and Judy McElroy have asked us to pray for their son Jonathan, his wife, and their four children, and his wife's mother. 
They all have COVID, and at this point, his wife has it the worst. And Janice and I would like to ask you to pray for a family friend from Ashland, a young lady named Carly, 27 years old, uh, who through complications from cystic fibrosis passed away in the past week. There is a five-year-old son and a three-month-old son with the family. So please continue praying for Carly and her fam- for Carly's family as they're having to face a future without her. And of course, we continue to pray for each other. Let's pray together. Eternal God, our everlasting Father, you who are the only real God, thank you for the gift of our lives at this time in history, in this place in the world. For all its problems, all its issues, Life in the United States is still a gift from you. Thank you for the freedoms that are our birthright as American citizens. And thank you for the men and women who have served our nation in defending those freedoms. Thank you most supremely for the freedom that we could never earn or purchase, freedom we could only receive as a gift, freedom from the penalty of sin. You have saved us from the penalty of sin. You are saving us now from the power of sin. And one day... You will save us from the very presence of sin and everything that separates us from you. Until that day, help us to walk by faith, to live day by day, trusting and obeying you and growing to know you better. Even when life's circumstances are painful or confusing or frightening, make us angry, seem unfair in the middle of all these things. Help us trust that you know exactly what you're doing and that you will do what is ultimately the very best. In the quiet of these moments, Lord, we lift before you the things that weigh on our hearts and minds this morning. We are grateful for this privilege of coming into your presence, knowing that it's not a right that we have, it is a privilege that you extend to us who know Jesus. And we do pray this morning for those on our prayer list for the concerns we have just listed, lifted before you. We pray for Irene and Clarence's daughter, Donna, and her family. For Jonathan McElroy, his wife, and their family. For Carly's family, as they must face the future without her. And that in this awful situation, 
you would not only minister your grace, but draw them to yourself. Thank you for your presence with us this day. And we lift our prayer to you in the mighty name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'm going to ask us to stand together as we sing.
from Hebrews 11 and then from 2 Timothy 2. Reading from the New Living Translation this morning. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. Through their faith, the people in days of old earned a good reputation. It would take too long to recount the stories of the faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and all the prophets. By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, and received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions, quenched the flames of fire, and escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. Women received their loved ones back again from death. But others were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at, and their backs were cut open with whips. Some were chained in prisons. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half. Others were killed with the sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for the world wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith, yet none of them received all that God had promised. For God had something better in mind for us, so that they would not reach perfection without us. Be strong through the grace that God gives you in Christ Jesus. Endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. In the many memorial services I have been privileged to be part of at Fort Indian Town Gap, one of the most moving moments in that service is the flag folding and presentation. The servicemen and women who perform this solemn ritual will salute both the flag they have just folded and the memory of the service person in whose memory the flag is being presented. And they do it with a slow salute. I was curious about that until I read a book by Marine Major Steve Beck, whose heart-wrenching task it was to inform the nearest of kin when a Marine was killed in Iraq. 
Beck didn't just break the sad news and then leave. He would, for several days, help the family through the process of the funeral, and that included supervising the Marine honor guard that stands near the fallen soldier's body. The honor guard learned from Beck how to salute their fallen fellow Marines as they left or resumed the guard with a slow salute that isn't taught in basic training. The slow salute requires a three-second raising of the hand, a three-second holding of the hand, and a three-second lowering of the hand. A gesture of respect that takes about nine times longer than a typical salute. And Beck explained, a salute to your fallen comrade should take time. Indeed, those who die serving their country are worthy of honor. This day, we recognize not only those who've died, but particularly those who still live and have served. This day, and many of you know what it was originally called. George had it. I would expect George would know that. Any of you else know what it was called? Armistice Day? In memory of the peace effect that went into effect on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month in the year 1918. Hostilities of World War I ended. The actual armistice was not signed until the following year. But on November 11th, 1918 at 11 a.m., Hostilities were declared to have ceased. It's a good day to honor and remember the living veterans who have served the country. It's also a good day to remember and honor those who have served the kingdom. We really can't call them veterans. Because the term inveteran implies someone who is living and no longer in active duty. In the service, the battle that is the Christian life, there are no living veterans. The only veterans of this kind of warfare have gone to their heavenly home. Those who are still alive continue the battle day by day. All who are living a life of faith in Jesus are engaged in a daily spiritual struggle to trust and obey Him. A little later, we're going to sing a song about those who are soldiers of the cross. People who follow Jesus. In the Bible, Paul refers to soldiers of Christ three times. And in each of those instances, he's referring to people who are leaders in the church. So in that sense, we are not all soldiers of Christ, as Paul was referring to them, but we are all engaged in the battle. That passage I read from 2 Timothy, Paul tells this young pastor who has been assigned by Paul to a very, very tough congregation the Ephesus church where Paul had spent a lot of time. Um, That was a tough gig for any pastor. And Timothy 
was not a hellfire and brimstone preacher. He was kind of timid. And Paul told him, this is not a place for you to be timid. And he told him, you are going to go through some tough times there. It's the place God wants you. I want you to endure hardship as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Those of you who have been in the military, do you remember basic training? As if you could ever forget that experience. Do you remember the hardships that you experienced when you were in active duty? Some of you got assigned to Hawaii. Okay, that wasn't such a tough gig. Others of you had some very, very difficult times. You experienced what it meant to suffer hardship. But the fact is, had you had the choice, you probably wouldn't have gone through that. But you went through that because someone else wanted you to. You were under orders. And you were following orders. You made someone else's desire more important than your own. Followers of Jesus who are facing this daily battle of faith face a very similar daily struggle to surrender our wills to his. Lord, you want me to do what? Forgive that rotten, no good? No, I guess I can't say those words. You want me to talk to that person? You want me to be kind? You want me to tell them there's a problem? We are soldiers under orders. One of the things that makes a soldier's life in the military a little easier is the fact that they can see and hear directly their commanding officer. And the commanding officer will give orders, and those orders are specific. Typically, they know what they need to do. Not always, but typically. We who follow Jesus can't see our commanding officer, but we can hear his voice in the word that he has spoken in the Bible, and we can hear his voice in the gathered company of believers, our comrades in arms spiritually. The daily battle that we fight is to live a life of faith. We're not always going to see, and what we see doesn't make any sense. And if we had the choice, we would just as soon not do this. But we're not living by sight, by what we see. We're living by faith. Faith sometimes can be a very easy thing. Let me ask, how many of you, when you first came in here, double-checked the pew that you were sitting on to make sure it would hold you? I'm not seeing anybody nodding to that. You took it on faith that this thing is going to hold you up. So far, so good. You've had some experience with this pew, and you know that in the past it's, it's done well, so you probably have a very good reason to put your faith in this pew. Uh, how many of you drove here this morning? Rode in a car? You get in the car, you put the key in ignition, you turn it on, you drive. How many of you here know how that works? Everybody looked at Tim in that moment. Some of us here could describe the workings of an internal combustion engine and the transmission and how it works. You don't have to know how it works to make it work. You just know you get in, you turn it on, and you drive. You have faith in that car. 
You can't explain the process, but you trust it. Our life as Christians is a very similar principle, although it's a lot more challenging. One missionary family was visiting back here in the States and were with one of their supporters and their eight-year-old son had been out playing. The missionary mom called to her son to come in and as he came in, she said, make sure to wash your hands before you eat. And the eight-year-old boy said, Jesus and germs, Jesus and germs, it's all I ever hear and I've never seen either one. Writer Philip Yancey described this situation. Once a friend of mine went swimming in a large lake at dusk. As he was paddling at a leisurely pace about 100 yards offshore, a freak evening fog rolled in across the entire lake and suddenly he could see nothing. No horizon, no landmarks, no objects in lights on the shore. And because the fog diffused all the light, he couldn't even see the setting sun. And so for 30 minutes, my friend splashed around in panic. He would start off in one direction but lose confidence and then turn 90 degrees to the right. But then he wasn't sure that was right, so he would turn to the left. It didn't, no matter, it didn't matter which direction he went, it felt wrong. So he stopped and floated, trying to conserve energy. And then he would try again, and it still didn't feel right. And then, completely lost, he heard sounds from the shore, voices in conversation, and he headed for the voices. Yancey goes on, something like that feeling of utter lostness must have settled in on poor Job as he sat in the ashes and tried to understand what was going on. He too had lost all landmarks, all points of orientation. Where should he turn? God, the one person who could guide him through the fog, was silent. The whole point of God's wager with Satan was to keep Job in the dark. Satan had asked, does Job fear God for nothing? Anybody can trust in a God who spoils his favorite with the greatest wealth in the Middle East. But to remove all the props, to withdraw into darkness, and then see what happens. The moment that God accepted the wager from Satan, the fog rolled in around Job God ultimately won the wager. Although Job questioned everything about God, we've heard so much about the patience of Job. Have you read the book? It's a long book, and it's full of poetry that sometimes doesn't make sense to us in the 21st century. But Job questioned everything about God, and a stream of angry outbursts and bitter complaints and he despaired of life, and he longed for death, but he would not give up on God. Though he slay me, do you know the rest of the verse? Yet will I trust him. Job defiantly maintained that trust in spite of all that had happened. He believed there was, when there was no reason to believe, he believed. He believed in the middle of the fog. Job stands as the most extreme example of what appears to be a universal law of faith. The kind of faith that God wants from us. Are you ready for this? The kind of faith that God wants from us seems to develop best when everything fuzzes over. When the lights get turned off and the fog rolls in. Yancey quotes a Christian psychologist named Paul Turnier and says, 
where there is no longer any opportunity for doubt, there is no longer any opportunity for faith either. It's easy to sit on a pew that you trust. It's hard to sit on a chair when the back is broken and you're not sure. I want to share a brief story with you. This past week, Janice and I were with Carly's family. Uh, She was one of twin girls. Carly was born with cystic fibrosis. Her twin was healthy. Carly fought CF all her life. This past summer, we were told that Carly was admitted to Hershey to the medical center because the CF and the bacteria that had developed had left her lungs in tatters and she was now on an ECMO machine. My understanding is when even, don't you hate it when the word just disappears, Um, the machine that helps you breathe. I'm sorry, say again? Ventilator. Ventilator, thank you. That's exactly what I was looking for. Even a ventilator wouldn't help because her lungs were so bad. The ECMO actually removes her blood, removes the carbon dioxide and reoxygenates the blood and then puts it back into her body. The machine was breathing for her. And her lungs could do virtually nothing for her. And then This past week, I got a call saying that she was not a candidate for bypass surgery. The lungs that would be implanted would wind up in the same state, and she probably would not even survive the surgery. And so this 27-year-old young woman has to wrestle with the question, Do I just let nature take its course and suffer and die? Or do I let them administer a sleep agent that will put me into a deep, deep sleep and then they will turn off the machine? How do you face a question like that? When you've got your whole life and your two beautiful boys still ahead of you. And I was privileged to be with them when the family gathered and some of them were asking, how can God let this happen? At 27 years of age, Carly decided to receive the medication and fall asleep. And at first I wrestled with the question, that isn't euthanasia. She was going to die. She just felt that she had struggled and suffered long enough. And so I ask you, every person who's here has struggled. Where is God when the fog rolls in? That's when you find out what faith is. Lord, I don't understand this. This doesn't make sense. This hurts. This isn't right. This isn't fair. But I trust you, and I will keep trusting you, and I will keep spending time with you and doing my best to obey you. Today we have honored our veterans and it was a powerful and inspiring time. And for many of us, we come to church because we want to feel better. And that story did not make you feel better and it wasn't designed to make you feel better. If you need to feel better, watch a Hallmark movie. We are here 
because there is a life that is real. We don't come here to feel better. We come to meet with God and find out why it is that we can trust him and find the courage and the strength to trust even when we don't understand. Lord, I don't understand this, but I trust you enough to still believe in you and still do things your way. Pray with me. None of us really wants to face the difficult things that we're going to face. But then we didn't want to face the things that we've already been through, and yet you brought us through. So much still going on right now. We pray for your strength to continue trusting you, to endure as a soldier of Christ Jesus on duty until the day that you finally say it's time to come home. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. Father, for your grace, you lead us and guide us in yet another time of remembrance of so many who have died in the wars, even chaplains, and those who came home 
or been marved, maimed in so many different ways. Some came home in a casket. And you, Lord, love us all. We pray that you will continue to, Lord, watch over us. And we want to continue to, to walk with you, to run with you, to be with you every day. May this be so as we conclude our services today and go out into the world as children of Christ. May we in turn perhaps come upon someone who needs to become a child of Christ, that you may bring them to the cross. And Lord, we will rejoice in all that you do for us, all that you share with us, all that you lead us into. Thank you, Lord, for all praise be unto you. Amen. Amen.